ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ಅಹಂಕಾರ ಪುಲಂಬೇದವೂಂಗು ಮದ್ದೀದಯ ತಾನ್ ಮರೆಯವನು ಮಾಲು ನಮಸ್ತೆ ವೆಲ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಟು ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟ್ರಿಪ್ ಟು ಶ್ರೀಲಂಕ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಅನ್ ಅನ್ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಡೀಪ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ದ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆರ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಅರೌಂಡ್ ದ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಸಮ್ ಪರ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ಯು ನೋ ಸಮ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ from Thiruvannamalai has proven to be, again, unexpected uh, insight that we had gone three and a half years ago into the Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. And uh, the reason we did that was because we were trying to present ramana's teaching and we realized we weren't getting through people weren't getting it or they were misunderstanding it and because of that they needed more preparation so now that time is finished I think I have given an adequate background in Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga that now we can concentrate on the real teaching, Ramana's real teaching, which begins from Raja Yoga, Vivarta Vada. You know, you've all seen the good old chart, huh? the four views, the four yogas and the four states of consciousness. So, Ramana's teaching is on the platform of Vivartavada, Raja Yoga. But it's not in the way that Raja Yoga is usually understood. Yes, it's true. Ramana rejects the platforms of karma, bhakti and ordinary yoga but that doesn't mean that you don't need to go through those stages what it means is that he was teaching for those who are ripe tivra adhikari he calls them tivra means ripe So this teaching is actually for those who are ripe. It's not for the beginners or even the medium students. They should be doing karma yoga and bhakti yoga. But when karma yoga matures, it spontaneously turns into bhakti and when bhakti matures, it spontaneously turns into meditation. So these are the candidates for Ramana's teaching which I think is the most elevated pure and succinct teaching that really there is in all spiritual life So I've been getting the inner guidance you know I follow the inner guidance I don't follow outward external rules and regulations and practices and especially the organizations that want to tell you what to do and what to think and all that stuff so i follow my inner guidance and my inner guidance is telling me what we need to do myself personally and my friends 
and as a community is to concentrate on Guru Vachaka Kowai. Uh, Guru Vachaka Kowai is the only book that systematically explains Ramana's teaching. Other books are in response to questions. For example, the talks were with Ramana Maharshi book. Very popular book and very useful, but it's not systematic. You know, it's like Bhagavad Gita. We've often commented that Bhagavad Gita contains everything you need to know about spiritual life. But it's presented in an unsystematic way. He jumps around from one subject to another, and it's very hard to follow uh, because he was responding to Arjuna, Arjuna's mindset, his situation, and his difficulties. So he had to skip around in order to address Arjuna's problem. But that makes it very difficult then for new students who, who want to understand the whole of spiritual life to go in and then make a system out of it that they can apply to themselves. Well, Ramana and Sadhu Om have done that in the uh, Guru Vachaka Kovai, which was actually composed by uh, Sri Muruganar and uh, edited, you could say, by Ramana Maharshi. Whenever Ramana would deliver an, an extraordinarily profound teaching, which was like every day, <laughs> practically, Muruganar would compose a Tamil verse expressing that teaching and then show it to Ramana Maharshi who would either approve it or edit it until it met his requirements. So there are over a thousand verses, I think a thousand two hundred and something verses. It's a very extensive book. But it's the only place I know of where these verses have been arranged into categories in the proper order of understanding. And so the first category, the first chapter, states it right out. Ramana is not interested in karma, bhakti, and ordinary yoga. He's only interested in the highest form of yoga, jnana yoga. So that doesn't mean that his followers or disciples or students uh, can reject karma and bhakti. Huh? Because the actual teaching is for the graduates of karma and bhakti yoga. This is something that's very misunderstood in the West. Because in India, there is a sufficiently large group of people who have already gone through karma and bhakti, often in their early part of life, in the youth. And they are actually the audience for Ramana's teaching. When Westerners came, if they were qualified, it was assumed they had become qualified in previous lives. And that, therefore, they didn't need to go through these other steps. But then, when Ramana's teaching became popular, people started to show up who were not qualified and who misconstrued, misunderstood, misrepresented Ramana's teaching. So that led to the development of so-called Neo-Advaita, 
which is basically a distortion that says, well, Ramana didn't need to practice karma and bhakti yoga. He just spontaneously became enlightened at age 16. So I don't need to either. Wrong. You're not on the same platform. Ramana is a very unique and highly advanced being. We cannot claim to be like him. That would be wrong. We're not like him. I went through more than 25 years of karma and bhakti yoga under strict discipline of a traditional guru before I sat down and did meditation and got first path within six weeks. You see? So does that mean that all of my students can just give up karma and bhakti and sit down and meditate and get first path in six weeks? No. No, because you don't have that background. You didn't leave your families and, and leave everything and go to India and accept initiation and discipline from a realized yogi. You didn't do that. So you don't have the karmic qualifications. You have to go through the lower stages before you're qualified for jnana yoga. But we're going to present this Guru Vachika Kowai so that you know the whole context of Ramana's teaching, which is the truth, uh, with a capital T. He did not uh, compromise his presentation of the truth. He, he did not indulge the followers of karma and bhakti and ordinary yoga. And the reason he didn't do that was there were already enough teachers on that level. See, we presented uh, karma and bhakti yoga because, uh, number one, there's a great need for it. You have to do these disciplines to get qualified for the higher yoga, raja and jnana. And number two, there are many teachers teaching karma yoga and jnana, uh, karma yoga and bhakti yoga, but they're teaching them in silos. They're teaching them in a sectarian, narrow way. Like, this is the only path. Huh? So that's not acceptable. We had to counteract that misinformation, that misunderstanding, and show the real teaching, which is that, in, to put it in capsule form, you don't have to make an effort to realize the self. The self is already realized just by the fact that we are conscious. But that doesn't mean there's no need for effort at all, because we still retain the vasanas, the upadis, the thought forms that project different views on the world and life. So there is a need for some effort to clean those up, to reduce or eliminate the vasanas and upadis and various other desires, hopes and dreams regarding the body and the world. So that's what we're going to be concentrating on on this channel going forward. Uh, I think I've already done enough 
on the lower yogas and pointed you to all the scriptures that describe them. And so now, given that, you know, I'm getting old, <laughs> I have to concentrate on the most powerful teaching, the most important teaching. So from now on, we're going to concentrate on the Guru Vachika Kowai. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya. <laughs>